pleasure today to introduce Katie Scott. Um, Katie is an associate professor over at the Tampa campus. Um, she did her undergrad at the University of Michigan and her PhD at Pennsylvania State. Um, Katie studies microbial physiology and specifically marine microbes. So without further ado, Katie Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, Maya, for inviting me. Thank you, College of Marine Science, for having me give a seminar for you. I'm very excited about this. It's awesome always to give a presentation to an audience with marine expertise. That's always great. So as was mentioned, I'm a microbial physiologist. And the thing that I study the most is carbon fixation by autotrophic microorganisms that live in the ocean. Some of these organisms are sulfur oxidizing organisms, and that's going to be the focus here. But as you'll, can see, as you'll understand later on, the things I'm presenting have ramifications beyond these organisms that I did not really expect. So lots of good surprises here. So the autotrophic microorganisms that I study use the Calvin cycle for carbon fixation, right? So you have Rubisco that uses carbon dioxide as a substrate, hooks the carbon dioxide onto a five carbon sugar. You get a transient six carbon intermediate that spontaneously falls apart into two molecules of phosphoglycerate, and the cells can build everything from that phosphoglycerate. So Rubisco uses carbon dioxide, and my organisms use the Calvin cycle. But not every autotrophic microorganism uses the Calvin cycle. There are currently six published carbon fixing pathways, the reasons why I have that caveat published is there's a seventh on the horizon that I'm, I got a sneak preview on. So there are more autotrophic pathways out there. So what I'm saying about the Calvin cycle is going to extend to a certain extent, as you'll see, to microorganisms that use other biochemistries besides the Calvin cycle. So diversity is in the title of my presentation, and there's a diversity of biochemistries of carbon fixation amongst autotrophic microorganisms. So just sort of park that information in your head for now, that there's a diversity of biochemistries. And then the other part that you should park in your head is that Rubisco, the carboxylase for the Calvin cycle, uses carbon dioxide. It cannot use bicarbonate. If you think about the structures of those two molecules, one's you know, charged and, tri and, and uh, triangle shaped. The other one is linear and nonpolar. So there's going to be enzymes that can only handle one or the other. And there isn't really enzymes that can handle both, although carbonic anhydrase can interconvert them. OK, so the Calvin cycle can only use carbon dioxide. Now, that pre presents a bit of a conundrum, because when inorganic carbon dissolves, it turns into all kinds of things. At low pH, carbon dioxide dominates. At circumneutral pH and towards seawater, bicarbonate dominates. But then over here, towards extremely high pH, carbonate dominates. So if you're a Calvin cycle organism and you're fixing carbon at a pH around circumneutral or ocean, a little alkaline, pH 8 plus, the form of inorganic carbon that's the most abundant is not the form of inorganic carbon that your carboxylase can fix. So that's a conundrum. To deal with that conundrum, um, well, actually, I'm not at the conundrum yet. Here's a little more conundrum before I get to the other part of the conundrum. So, OK, carbon dioxide can be a problem in the ocean. But then if you live in other habitats where autotrophic microorganisms fix carbon, the problem becomes larger and more complicated. You've got autotrophic microorganisms that live at a variety of pHs from extreme acidophiles to extreme alkalophiles. And the dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations in these habitats are all over the waterfront. You're going to have habitats where carbon dioxide is dominant. You're going to have uh, habitats where bicarbonate is dominant. And you're also going to have habitats where carbonate dominates. So if that matches the specificity of your carboxylation enzyme, great. But what if it doesn't? To deal with this, cyanobacteria have well-characterized carbon concentrating mechanisms. There are many researchers who've dedicated a lot of time and effort to characterizing the cyanobacterial carbon concentrating mechanism. They've characterized it in freshwater cyanobacteria, and they've also characterized it in marine cyanobacteria, too. So the freshwater guys, they have three evolutionarily independent bicarbonate uptake systems, BICA, SBTA, and an ABC transporter. They also have a carbon dioxide trapping mechanism. If you're curious, I can talk to you about it later. Not the emphasis of this presentation, but it helps with their carbon concentrating mechanism. The marine ones, 
have two biochemically, or sorry, evolutionarily independent bicarb transporters, and they also have a carbon dioxide trapping mechanism as well. The whole point of all of this membrane transport is to generate an elevated concentration of, of bicarb inside the cytoplasm. Now, at this point, you be, should be kind of squinting and doing the tippy dog head thing, because I told you that Rubisco, the carboxylase that these guys use for carbon fixation, cyanobacteria, of course, use the Calvin cycle, uses carbon dioxide and not bicarbonate. So what's the point of packing your cytoplasm full of bicarb if you can't use it? That's where the second part of the carbon concentrating mechanism comes in. They have these protein-bound polyhedral inclusions called carboxosomes. And inside of the carboxosomes, that's where the Rubisco is. What else is in the carboxosome is carbonic anhydrase. So what happens is that the bicarbonate travels from the cytoplasm to the inside of the carboxosome. And that carbonic anhydrase converts some of that bicarbonate to carbon dioxide. Rubisco's right here. It's going to fix that carbon dioxide before it has a chance to diffuse out again. So this is a way of making your cell essentially pretty darn close to leak proof with respect to carbon dioxide. So obviously a really great thing to be able to do if you're going under low CO2 conditions. You don't want to lose the stuff that you've gone to quite a bit of energetic effort to transport into your cytoplasm. So carbon concentrating mechanism, cyanobacteria, arsenal transporters, carboxysome. Those are the two pieces there. So that's all been really well characterized in one phylum. So here's our understanding of a big portion <laughs> of the ecophysiology of carbon fixation. This is a Citrelli super tree, shows several, but certainly not all, of the phyla of bacteria and archaea. It's a great start, and these people have done some exquisite physiology. But as you can tell, there's a lot of territory that remains to be covered, and a lot of habitats that we haven't even addressed with the cyanobacterial studies. So there was a microorganism that I was using as a negative control as a graduate student. And this is a lovely little story for graduate students who have a control that isn't doing what it's supposed to because the negative control turned out to be a positive control. <laughs> um, and also a really lovely uh, organism that I based a lot of subsequent work on because it turned out to be way cooler than the organisms I was focusing on for my PhD. <laughs> nature, nature has its own agenda. But anyway, the organism was Hydrogena vibrio cunidinus, and it's a member of the gamma proteobacteria. It's from the deep sea hydrothermal vents. It's an obligate um, chemolithoautotroph. It can't grow on organic compounds. You give it organic carbon, and it's kind of like, it won't grow any better when you provide it. It won't take it up. Um, the thing is, it's got a really rapid growth rate. For chemolithoautotroph, it's great. It's got a doubling time in seawater supplemented with thiosulfate of one hour. So it's great. You can get a lot of cells fast. It was isolated from an extremely erratic environment, and that environment, of course, is the deep-sea hydrothermal vents. This organism is a mesophile, not a thermophile. People say, oh, vents, it's going to live at 100 degrees. No, this guy lives at room temperature up to about 32, 34, and then it starts to slow down a bit. It was isolated from some scrapings from the outside of some riftia pacoptilla tube worms. So this habitat is all over the place. From below, you have dilute hydrothermal fluid coming up. It's about 40 degrees Celsius at most. And it's interfacing with bottom water, hitting these organisms from above. So two degrees meets 40 degrees. They aren't going to mix and create a stable you know, gradient. Since there's a temperature differential, as they meet, they're going to mix in eddies. So as a result, the temperature on the side of one of these tube worm tubes is going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. But the temperature isn't the part that's all that interesting. The hydrothermal fluid that's coming from below is carrying sulfide. The bottom water is carrying oxygen. So the redox chemistry is going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But then the other thing that's going to go back and forth and back and forth is the pH. The dilute hydrothermal fluid has a pH of around 5.5. The bottom water has a pH of 7.8 to 8, it's bottom of the Pacific. So their pH is going to go back and forth. The hydrothermal fluid also has sometimes as much as 5 millimolar dissolved in organic carbon. The bottom water, of course, is around 2.2, a little more sometimes 2.3. So the CO2 concentration is also going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So these oscillations are seconds long, minutes long, hours long, days long. It just, it's very erratic. So these guys have to deal with a very temporarily and spatially erratic habitat. So I thought, well, maybe that means that these guys might be predisposed to have a carbon concentrating mechanism. 
when I was using them as a negative control for my graduate studies, one of the things that I noticed about them is they were quite happy growing at really low dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations. Now these are sulfur oxidizers, so if you don't keep an eye on them, they can acidify their growth medium, drop it down to about pH 5 or so, because they convert reduced sulfur compounds to sulfuric acid as they grow. So I was monitoring the chemistry of these cultures pretty closely. I brought the buffer concentration with heaps up to about 100 millimolar, and I would titrate them to keep them at pH 8 the whole time they were growing. I was also measuring the dissolved gases in the cultures with a gas chromatograph. And one thing that I noticed was despite my efforts, I was keeping the pH at 8. I would start the DIC, the dissolved inorganic carbon concentration, at about 2 millimolar. But once they started creeping up into exponential growth, they were dropping the inorganic carbon concentration down to 0.1 millimolar and still growing just fine. So these guys can grow rapidly despite really low concentrations of inorganic carbon. I was using them as a negative control for carboxysomes, but when I did the EMs, I found carboxysomes because they're listed in Burgess as not having carboxysomes. You know, you figure you can trust Burgess? <laughs> no. <laughs> So they have carboxysomes. They can grow rapidly despite the a really low concentration of inorganic carbon. So I did a careful characterization of that growth um, under a variety of inorganic carbon concentrations here at USF with chemostats and verified that. So if they have a carbon concentrating mechanism, they've got the carboxysomes. They can grow under low CO2 conditions. The other piece is they need to be able to pack their cytoplasm full of bicarbonate. They need to be able to generate elevated concentrations of intracellular bicarbonate. So in order to measure this, I used an old technique that was used when people were first starting to understand how mitochondria worked called silicone oil centrifugation, very old school physiology. And it's a way to measure solute accumulation inside of bacterial cells. So, okay, measuring a dissolved gas inside of a bacterial cell. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> so with silicone oil <laughs> centrifugation, what you do is it's kind of like creating a miniature mudslide. You get a Eppendorf tube. You put a very dense killing solution in the bottom. It's got a high concentration of triton and glycine to make it really super dense. You overlay that with a layer of silicone oil, and then you put your incubation solution above that. The incubation solution contains a radiolabeled substrate that you want to track uptake of. In my case, it was inorganic carbon, carbon-14 inorganic carbon. You add your cells to that. You do a time course. Over that time course, you centrifuge the tube. The cells wind up in the killing solution, leaving the stuff that's extracellular up here. So you can measure the inorganic carbon that's accumulated in the cytoplasm by grabbing the tubes out of the centrifuge, throwing them in liquid nitrogen until everything is frozen, then you clip off the bottom with dog toenail clippers into a <laughs> scintillation vial. <laughs> yeah, I was proud to incorporate such a high-tech device into my experiment. <laughs> and you, you clip that into a scintillation vial, and you can track the incorporation of whatever solute you're studying, in my case, carbon-14 inorganic carbon. I also did ex um, parallel experiments with sorbitol and tritium so I could estimate the volume. So you've got an amount and a volume. You can calculate a concentration. And that's what I'm showing over here. This is cells that were grown under low inorganic carbon conditions, incubated very quickly at a range of, interest, of um, inorganic carbon concentrations. And I measured the intracellular inorganic carbon concentrations. The dotted line is the unity line. That would be same, same inside and outside. As you can see, they're way higher than that. So these guys have really high compared to outside intracellular inorganic carbon concentrations. They've got carboxysomes. They can grow under low CO2 conditions. They've got a belly full of bicarbonate. Ergo, they have a carbon concentrating mechanism. That's a lot. That's like an order of two orders of magnitude. Yeah, not quite as good as cyanobacteria. You should see what cyanobacteria do. It's even insaner, if that's a word. <laughs> so I was really excited about this, and I thought, great, wow proteobacterial carbon concentrating mechanism. And so I wrote a white paper to the JGI and said, could you sequence this? Because I was expecting to find homologs to the cyanobacterial bicarbonate transporters. I thought, oh, wow, there's going to be a nice horizontal gene transfer story here or something. I had them sequence it. They found the carboxysome operon. They found all sorts of cool stuff, but no homologs to the cyanobacterial bicarbonate transporters. You know, cue the sad trombone noise. I was initially kind of really sad about that, but then I thought, no, wait, this is actually way cooler. They're using a different 
transporter. There's, some, there's a neat twist here. This is even better than if I'd found cyanobacterial transporters. So the next thing I wanted to do is identify these bicarb transporters. I couldn't do it based on homology to um, cyanobacterial ones, so I tried a variety of approaches. I did a transcriptome of low and high DIC cells. The carboxysome genes lit up, some other interesting stuff lit up, but no obvious candidates for bicarbonate transporters um, showed up. I was using microarrays, and sometimes those aren't the most sensitive things in the universe. That was the technology of the times. Didn't see anything that gave me a solid lead there, so undeterred, I, just, I tried a proteomic approach where I grew cells under low and high inorganic carbon concentrations and compared the proteins that were present in both kinds of cells to find ones that are more abundant when cells are grown under low inorganic carbon conditions, figuring those might be parts of an inducible carbon concentrating mechanism. So the list of um, proteins that were more abundant when cells were grown under low inorganic carbon concentrations are here. Intriguingly, a few of the prophage, it has a prophage in its genome, a few of the prophage ones lit up just a little bit more than threshold. The carboxysome genes all sang like canaries, which is good. That's a positive control. There were some out, uh, outer membrane-associated proteins that showed up too. But then there was this really weird one, TCR0854. And that, that one got me kind of going, hmm, that was a clue. At the same time as we were doing the proteome study, I had a graduate student working with an army of undergraduates to make a mutant library in, in uh, Hydrogena verbio cunogenis. So this is Mary Mangiapia. This was a big part of her master's thesis. The, between the two of us and a few undergrads, we developed Hydrogena verbio cunogenis as a genetic system. We, threw everything in the book at it to try to get it to take up DNA so that we could introduce mutations in its genes. We figured out a way to conjugate it with E. coli so that we could do both random and site-directed mutagenesis on it. So we developed it as a tool. And so the site-directed is what you use if you know what you're going for. So that 854 gene, that one was intriguing to me. So I used our site-directed system to specifically knock that gene out. We knew, though, that we were flying blind, that this was kind of a weird carbon concentrating mechanism. So we also did the random mutagenesis approach, where you basically carpet bomb the genome and create a library of organisms, each of which has a single gene interrupted. We took the site-directed and the random mutants and screened them for sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Basically, we assumed that if cells could not grow or grew poorly under low CO2 conditions, we probably introduced a gene that was part of the carbon concentrating mechanism. So Mary and several years of microbial physiology lab students created a library that totaled over 12,000 mutants, and they screened that library of over 12,000 mutants. They came up with a collection of about 20 mutants that reliably could not grow under low CO2 conditions. That little miniature library, or bookmobile if you will, was subsequently <laughs> screened for mutations in the carboxysome operon, because we weren't that interested in carboxysomes, because those had already been pretty well studied in cyanobacteria, as well as in some sulfur oxidizing chemoautotrophic by Gordon Cannon and Sabina Heinhorst. So that work had been done. We were looking for transporters. <coughs> we removed the part of the bookmobile that had mutations in the carboxysomes, saved one for positive control, but took a closer look at the mutants that were not mutations in the carboxysome operon. So we had the site-directed mutation in gene 854. It turns out that one of the random mutants in Mary's bookmobile also was a random mutation in 854. So that was kind of cool. Two techniques highlighted the same gene. We did growth experiments that were a little more sensitive to than the ones in those 96 well placed to confirm phenotype. We had our carboxysome mutant up here. The red dots are no growth under low CO2 conditions. The blue dots show growth. The reason why it's lumpy, bumpy, and goes up and down is that these guys sometimes produce large amounts of elemental sulfur as they grow, which they produce and then they eat. So the absorbance sometimes goes up and then down. But it's, it's convincing growth. And then we had a negative control. It was a site-directed mutation in a gene that we did not anticipate to be involved in the carbon concentrating mechanism based on the transcriptome and the proteome. The protein was always present at the same concentration. The transcript is always similarly abundant in both populations of cells. You can see, you know, you have growth under high CO2, 
And you also have growth under low CO2. There's a bit of a lag because the inoculum was from high CO2, but they grow. So that's a low CO2 sensitive mutant. This is normal, pretty close to how wild type behaves. Here's 854, that protein that showed up in the proteum study that also turned up in our random library as well as being CO2 sensitive. And here you can see that CO2 sensitivity. Grows fine under high CO2, dead as a doornail under low CO2. So like, OK, this thing is part of a carbon concentrating mechanism. What the heck is 854? So I looked at the genome and had this really informative annotation for that gene, Duff 2309. <laughs> So DUF, <laughs> DUF stands for Domain of Unknown Function. <laughs> Great. You know, so again, sad trombone noise. But at the same point, it's also like, well, this is actually kind of cool, because maybe we've nailed a function onto something that's not been studied before, which is better. I took a look at the neighborhood to see what was around it. Now, this is downstream of the carboxysome operon in hydrogen verbio crinogenus. The neighbor gene upstream of it is 853. Cleverly named. <laughs> now, this one belonged to a PFAM. It's a homologue of one of the subunits, the transmembrane subunits of NADHD hydrogenase. Now, when I took a look at 854, when I had these data from the libraries, I'm like, oh, maybe this is a transporter. What you expect with a transporter is that it's going to have transmembrane alpha helices, right? Because it's got to insert itself in the cell membrane. Well, 854 had none of that nonsense, but 853 does. It's got all these transmembrane helices like crazy. Um, this is a graph showing a, uh, it's a hydrophobicity plot that shows predicted transmembrane alpha helices. So this one goes back and forth. It stitches back and forth across the uh, cell membrane, just as you'd expect a transporter to do. So I saw this and its neighbor, and I thought, maybe these guys act together to form a bicarbonate or other inorganic carbon transporter. So to convince myself of that, I did a bunch of follow-up experiments. I did a site-directed mutagenesis experiment on 853 to see if that resulted in a CO2-sensitive phenotype, and it did. And then the next thing I did was I did some transcription work where I proved that the two genes are co-transcribed. Okay, so they're on the same piece of mRNA together. So that was all interesting. Here's the uh, phenotype data showing the ability of these mutants to accumulate intracellular inorganic carbon and the loss of that capability. So here's 668. That's the one, the site-directed mutant. That's kind of our positive control. It's saying, OK, we've got our, um, our uh, transposon. It's kind of a positive control for what happens just when you manipulate hydrogen of genus. You can see that it 